Facebook was partially down for some users in the U.S. on Wednesday. In many cases, the platform wasn't working at all. Dave Lee with our partners at BBC News reports from San Francisco. Elaine, this is the worst outage Facebook has had since 2008. And, of course, the site was a very different place back then. It just had a mere 150 million users. That's a fraction of the 2.5 billion users that typically use it in a month now. This outage, it began this morning here in San Francisco, and it's affected the Facebook app, it's affected Instagram, it's affected WhatsApp, it's affected Messenger, which is another Facebook product. It's also been causing problems for Facebook's virtual reality platform, Oculus Rift. So it's fair to say this has been a huge problem for the company. They have confirmed that they are working on solving the issue. They haven't given a specific reason as to why this has happened yet, uh, but they did deny reports that it had been the victim of what's known as a distributed denial of service attack. That's a type of cyber attack where attackers will flood a certain service with a huge amount of traffic with the idea of overwhelming that site. Facebook has said that hasn't happened to them. But what they can't say at the moment is what has exactly gone wrong. Elaine? Dave Lee, thank you. It will be in your views, and uh, is it shaping the future of Facebook? Yeah, so uh, virtual and augmented reality are areas that, that I, am, I am very excited about for the future. And the, the reason is that, you know, what we are really focused on at Facebook is helping people connect. Right? That's what I, what I wake up in the morning and go to bed at night thinking about. And a lot of the experiences that I've wanted to be able to build around helping people connect with each other, um, even from before I started Facebook, you, you really need a technology that helps you feel like you're right there with another person in order to deliver those. So what virtual and augmented reality are all about is delivering this sense of presence, right? The feeling like you're really there in another place um, and with another person, which is different from any other technology that we've had. When we're looking at our screens, um, and whether it's a phone or a or a computer, or we're doing this this video chat, you know, it's 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 a uh, you know enough to give us a, a mild sense of presence, like we're there with each other. But we're basically you know the whole time we know that we're in a different place, and and, and we're just trying to you know kind of trick our mind into thinking that we're together. Whereas with virtual and augmented reality, um, you know, it, it really delivers the sense of presence. I mean, that's why you mentioned vertigo before. That's because you, your, your mind, you, you really felt like you were in a different place um, and were afraid of, of falling off of whatever you were standing on, which, you know, isn't the main sensation we're trying to deliver in virtual reality, but, but it gives a sense of the, the type of presence that, um, that is possible and how, and how emotionally resonant that is. Um, so there are a few different directions for this technology that, that we're excited about. Um, one is virtual reality, which is what Quest 2 is. Um, and that is basically a completely immersive experience where you know, you're, you're in it and, yeah, um, and, and you feel like you're in a completely different place, a completely virtual environment. Um, and then there's augmented reality, which is eventually going to take the form of you know, a normal looking pair of glasses, which can um, you know, put holograms in the world um, and blend the digital 3D world um, and give you a sense of presence there while, while, while kind of still being in the physical world around you. So, you know, the, the holy grail there, you know, is five years from now when we're at, you know, a future version of VivaTech together, um, you know, if, if I can't make it to Paris, um, you'll have, you know, hologram Mark um, sitting on the couch next to you, um, or I'll have hologram Maurice sitting on my couch here uh, in California. And, um, and, and when I want to show you what the next version of, of, of Quest or or, um, or the, the augmented reality glasses are that we're working on, I'll just be able to you know, snap my fingers and here's a hologram version of it and I can hand it to you and you can you can you can touch it and you can put it on and, and feel it. Um, you know, if we want to play a game, you know, we'll be able to just snap my fingers here. Here's the game. Um, so it's going to be incredibly powerful. It already it already is in a lot of ways. Um, VR with Quest Two is has reached an inflection point where it's now. Um, you know, starting to take off a bit faster than even we we expected, um, and a, a lot of the use today is games, right? Really immersive environments, media, games. Um, but part of what is exciting to me is that we're also starting to see it branch out beyond that. Um, a lot of the experiences are social experiences, people hanging out with each other, which at the end of the day is why why Facebook is in this and why we're helping to build this. Um, but we're also seeing things like um, fitness apps, you know, whether that's 
um, Supernatural or Fit XR or um, you know any of these things where you think about it like Peloton, um, where you have a subscription, but um, but instead the device is VR and you put on your headset and you're in this amazing environment and you're doing a boxing class with an instructor or a dance class and it's you know great cardio, but you're doing it with your headset. So it's quickly expanding beyond games. Um, into a bunch of other use cases. And we think that this is eventually going to be um, the, a big part of the next major computing platform after, um, you know, after phones and, and after PCs. It's not like computers are going away or phones are going away, but I think that this has the potential to be something at that scale of importance in the world. And when it is, I, I just think these social experiences that we're gonna be able to deliver through that by having a real sense of presence with another person are, are just gonna be amazing. I mean, this is what I've been you know, hoping that would exist for like 15 years now. So getting to play a, a role in helping to build this um, is certainly one of the most exciting things that I think we get to work on now. Yes, I, I have experienced both. The virtual reality with, uh, where I have been uh, uh, transported uh, in a place uh, which was a new office with somebody else uh, who was not there by the way, both of us were not in that office, but we were meeting, and it was uh, giving me the feeling that uh, the next future meeting of board meetings or kind of the uh, um, client meeting or whatever can happen through virtual reality. But augmented reality is something which is also absolutely thrilling. Um, the headset is going to change? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I think we've Can just Can you tell now, us how it will be? Yeah, I mean, I think we've just hit sort of the minimum threshold form factor um, that, that, that's going to be kind of a mass market device. I mean, this is, um, you know, I think we, we've learned that it needs to do a, a few things. One is, in order for this to be wi widely adopted, it needs to be wireless, right? The early version of, of, of Rift, probably, that you tried um, had a wire. And so you could you could look around and you can see a world and it could be it could feel immersive. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're trying to walk around through a space um, or if you're trying to do fitness, you don't want to have a wire that like gets wrapped around you, right? I mean, so it, it really breaks the feeling of the sense of presence. But doing all of this wirelessly, um, you know, delivering the technology to you know we need to, and, and I think it's 10 milliseconds um, and when you turn your head, render a complete image of the world. Um, it, before your eye can kind of refresh its vision or else um, you know, it feels very unnatural. So the, the computational problems here um, are, are just ones that, you know, there aren't many companies in the world that, that can deliver that kind of technology to build that, but the wireless piece is very important. Over time, it's gonna to have to get lighter and smaller too. Um, for virtual reality, um, there, are a few, there are fewer constraints there because you're, you tend to be doing it you know, in your home or in an office and you're not, you're not kind of like sitting there in a meeting with another person. But for augmented reality, that's where it gets really tough because we're basically going to have to deliver all this technology in what will end up being a normal looking pair of, of glasses, right? So if you think about the, the technology problem here, we're basically trying to fit um, like a supercomputer into a pair of glasses that, that can do things like put holograms into the world and do all this 3D rendering that hasn't really ever been done before in this tiny form factor. And we, we have to deal with problems like not only getting enough compute power to be able to make that work, but having it not get so hot that it becomes uncomfortable on your face and having it so that in a pair of glasses, we can fit a battery that will last all day. So these are really interesting technology challenges. I actually think that these are some of the most um, challenging and, and important technology challenges of the next decade to be able to unlock. And so both from a social and experience perspective and you know, how um, you know, interesting of a challenge this is to work on, it's, it's something that I think is, is really exciting. And you know, let me say well, one more thing on this is, you know, while, while AR glasses of the type that I'm talking about don't exist yet, um, you know, all the technology challenges haven't, haven't been worked out yet. I, I think we're still you know, a few years away from this. Um, one of the things that I am excited about is we're partnering with Essilor Luxottica to ship a pair of smart Ray-Ban glasses this year. So they're, they're not gonna be augmented reality glasses, um, but they're gonna be smart glasses that basically look and, and feel like Ray-Bans, but can add a lot more technology and, um, and, and interesting use cases to that, um, that, that, we'll, that we'll get into at some point over the, over the next couple of months. Um, but, but I'm really excited for that collaboration. 
Um, and I think that that's going to be a great product too. And that's, that's kind of on the path to, to the future that we're building here. And yeah. let, let me just say one more thing about the meetings because, you know, having, um, having meetings in virtual reality, um, is pretty amazing. Um, you, you know, one of the big pieces that we work on, it's not just the, the hardware platforms, it's the, the software platform around it. You know, it's, it's kind of helping to contribute to this vision that a lot of companies are calling the metaverse, right? The idea that, um, that you know, there, there are different universes or worlds that we'll all be able to teleport into um, and we'll be able to do all these different things. And one of them is going to be work, right? One of the things that we're going to want to do is work and you're going to want to have a virtual office where you can come into and have staff meetings and all that. Um, and compared to video conferences, I actually think that even with the state of virtual reality today, um, there are a lot of reasons why it actually feels better to have meetings in virtual reality. For one, you know, people are very spatially oriented. You know, I kind of think about, um, you know, we make memories based on, okay, I heard, you know, you were on my right in this meeting and, and I heard you talking from my right. And I, and I, I, I looked over there and I saw the context of what was in the background. And, you know, we kind of lose that all when we're on video chat. You know, we're, we're just, there's a grid of faces and, you know, everything kind of feels the same. And, you know, I find myself having a hard time remembering what happened in certain meetings because there's not really a sense of place, um, it, which is what you get in virtual reality. You, you feel like you're in a place with people. So that's already very powerful today. And I think some of the new kind of metaverse software that, um, that, that we and others are going to be, you know, helping to contribute to this overall vision will make it so that a lot of meetings and other use cases um, will be able to happen in, in VR um, quite well, I think, in the, in the near term. If we want to take maximum advantage of uh, AR and VR, we need a platform with a lot of apps. Uh, I have uh, experience that uh, we have the possibility of seeing movies or uh, series or whatever from Netflix. We can also uh, travel. We can have gaming. Uh, a lot of things uh, are already on the library. Um, how this will work? This means that you will have a lot of people who will come uh, and uh, we have a reference of the app and the app will be referenced and uh, people will be able to use it. Well, I think that there are a few different kinds of things that are going to get built. So one is, you know, the analogy of apps like we have on our mobile phones, right? which is a developer will create a whole experience and you'll go into that experience. But I think another big part of this that's part of this metaverse vision is that we're also going to have a lot of digital goods, um, you know, whether it's clothing for, for yourself that will be digital or, you know, it's, um, you know, when I was talking before about how if I wanted to show you a future model of Quest, I can have a hologram for that. That's a digital good. Um, you know, or a future version of the Ray-Ban glasses. That's a digital good. I, I actually think, you know, if you do this thought experiment, where walk around for a day and think about how many of the things that are in your life don't actually need to be physical and could be easily replaced by a digital hologram in a world where you had, um, where you had glasses. Um, you know, basically any media, right, any art, um, you know, it, like... So any screen, right? Any TV in the future won't need to actually exist physically. You, know, you could just—it could just be an app that that your glasses kind of project onto a wall, um, and, and that can be shared among you know everyone who's who's your friends who's watching that. So that's going to unlock this whole creative economy. Where now, you know, instead of you know producing a TV or producing you know some some kind of complex um, physical thing, you know, requires factories or a lot of materials. You know, any any kid or, or developer or creator around the world is going to be able to do this with a, a set of 3D development tools um, and code, and that they'll be able to sell their their products without having to worry about logistics or shipping it around. Um, so it all contributes to this uh, bigger hope that, that that I think we share with a lot of other companies to help bring about this creative economy. And you know, I think a, a you know my view on this is that any real positive vision for the future should involve a lot more people being able to do creative work that they enjoy than um, rather than than just having to you know do jobs that that maybe they have to do to make a living or, or that they that they don't find as rewarding and in order to do that um, you, you don't just it, you need to go beyond just delivering this awesome consumer experience you also need to build tools that can help all of these individual creators and businesses make money so that they eventually millions and millions or tens of millions of people can make a living doing this. And, and that's how we make this something that, 
um, that doesn't just create an awesome user experience and, and create awesome social experiences, but creates a, a an economic tide that helps create opportunity for people around the world. And I think that that is equally exciting um, and, and something that I think we're going to see get unlocked over the next five to 10 years. Yes, we will come back to the creators because I, I know that you are passionate about the uh... The, the creative industry and the fact that uh, everyone can do uh, a creative work and uh, get some living out of it. And this is absolutely great for a lot of people. But maybe uh, let's let be a little bit more precise on uh, to, before closing on AR and VR. Sure. Um, how this uh, will work for the consumer? Is this something that uh, they will get through subscription or pay per usage or how do you plan to make it accessible for the users? Um, so are you referring to the apps or the devices overall? Because I mean, I guess the answer would be a little for, different. I mean, for, much more for the apps because I guess for uh, the, the device, uh, it will be something that they will buy at a relatively cheap price in the future. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, maybe it's worth actually going going through both. I mean, I'll, I'll touch on the device quickly, which is, you know, our our vision and, and mission at Facebook is to serve everyone in the world, right? So, so we're not a company that tries to build kind of luxury or or, or pr products that we sell at a huge premium for a smaller set of people. You know, we want to build something that's accessible to ev to everyone. So, you know, I mean, we're not looking at this in terms of thinking, okay, we're going to build this amazing technology. How much can we sell it for? We're looking at this and saying, okay, how, how cheap can we make this? So that way as many people as possible can get access to. And that will mean basically we're going to be selling the devices either, you know, at the cost that it, make, that it takes us to make them, um, or maybe we'll even subsidize them a bit um, in order to help get them in more people's hands. Um, so that way as many people as possible can experience this. And I think that's going to be a different approach than what other companies take. Um, for apps, I think that they're going to be a, a wide range of, of – um, of different content. Um, you know, some of it is going to be free. Um, some of it is going to be paid where you pay up front. Some of it will be a subscription. Um, a lot of these things I think will, will, will allow for commerce around digital goods um, within the apps. So if you think about you know, some of these metaverse experiences that I'm talking about, I mean, a lot of this, you know, we're, we're, you know we, we and other developers are probably going to want to make getting into those worlds free, but then make it so that people can, can buy different goods within them. And a lot of the goods, it's not just going to be, you know, us. It's not going to be us selling them as, 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 um, as just kind of one seller. We want to enable a whole marketplace of that so you can buy things from other developers um, as well. So it's going to be all of these different models. But ultimately, I think in order to support the creative economy um, and, and to, to, to support the, the type of, um, you know, development and talent that is going to exist in virtual and augmented reality, um, there are going to need to be a lot of different business models. Not everyone does just one thing. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I didn't mention advertising, but of course, that's that's an incredibly important part of this, and, and an area where we have you know a lot of strength that we can bring to helping creators and developers monetize um, as well. But you know, right now, if you compare the size of virtual and augmented reality to mobile phones um, or even game consoles, it's a lot smaller. Which means that if you're a developer and you're choosing today, you know where where should I go develop to make the most money? Um, we really need to make the monetization work in order to, to earn the time and, and attention and focus of the best developers to build content for these new platforms. And, you know, I think that's, that's working really well now. I think that there's um, you know, something like um, 50 or 60 different um, developers or titles that, um, that, that have made more than a million dollars, right? So that, you're, you're definitely starting to see that take off and, and, and do well for, um, for a lot of different types of developers. Um, and, but over time, it's going to be the sum of a lot of different ways that they can make money that is going to um, enable the kind of economy that we need to, to have take place here. It looks like uh, you will have a kind of competition. You will have collaboration or cooperation with a lot of uh, uh, creators, and you will be also competing with uh, some uh, well-established entertainment uh, or gaming companies. So it will be quite interesting to watch. Let's go back. Yeah, that's definitely the, right. Yeah. Uh, and, and you will have a platform with a lot of apps. This reminds me something else, uh, maybe not very far from where you are. Uh, uh, let's go back to the creators. 
And uh, I know that this is very dear to your heart and it's something that you really are caring a lot about. And you have started to explain what you want to do. I think it's uh, uh, fantastic because a lot of people have uh, great ideas. They would like to make them um, real and to make some living out of them. Maybe you, you can tell us why have you started to think about the creators? What has been the, uh, the trigger which led you to, be, to think that you have to offer that kind of uh, solution to the creators? And how do you believe that uh, they will be coming and uh, developing a lot of work and um, uh, what kind of living they can make out of it? Yeah, so I thought there were a number of, of different trends in the, in the world that have, that have kind of led us to, to focus on this. You know, one is, is just that I think we're seeing social media um, become more of an economic opportunity um, for a lot more people. Right? There are hundreds of millions of small businesses um, who use our services that, that in, in, in ways that they tell us are, are really important for, for making a living for them and, and, and keeping their businesses sustainable. Um, and we think that that's going to be true um, increasingly for for kind of individuals doing creative work as well. And we kind of consider a creator to be, um, you know, a, a business that is basically a personality, right? And, and the, who, 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 is, who is producing content. And it could be any kind of content. It could be, you know, you're an independent writer. It could be you're producing videos. Uh, it could be that you're, um, that you stream playing games, um, right? It's, it's so there, there are a whole lot of different, um, you, you're an influencer in a certain area. Uh, that and, and you've built up a community using groups or, or some other tools. And we want to make it so that all of these different groups of people can make a living doing this, right? It's, I mean, the, the content that, that they're producing um, fuels important online communities that people care about, um, but it is you know, hard to make. It, it requires people who are talented, who dedicate a lot of their time to it. And you know, a lot of these people, maybe they, they have another job somewhere, but in the future, and this is really their passion is what they want to work on. So if we can make it so they can sustain making a living and, and doing well um, across our services, then, then we think we can enable a lot more creative work. Um, we think that's a, a kind of more compelling version of the future economy, which is one where people get to do creative work that they, that they like. Um, and it also will benefit our services because then there will be more creative content and better content and better communities um, across what we're doing. So. You know, we try to do this not just focused on one type of media. You know, there are other services like YouTube, right, that, that might focus on video and I think are doing quite good work on this. Um, but the, the defining aspects of, um, of, of Facebook and some of our platforms are we try to support all different kinds of media. And um, so, you know, earlier this week, um, you know, I announced that for, for uh, game streamers, you know, we were starting to roll out. Um, you know, fan groups. So that way, you know, when they're, they, they basically have, um, you know, when, the, when they're not in the act of, 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 you know, streaming a game, their community can get together and, and, and talk and they can, they can kind of help grow and nurture that community even when they're not, when they're not kind of getting them together to play games. And, and we, we've launched a whole bunch of, of features around stars that people can tip and, 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 and give money to their favorite creators and subscriptions. Um, but that's just one type of area. Another area um, that I'm really excited about that we have something coming very soon is around independent writers, um, where you know we want people to be able to make a, a, a living uh, not just writing content on Facebook, but off Facebook too. So there's been this whole trend around newsletters, and we think that that's going to be really important. And we're we're basically we're building a service there that's going to start rolling out soon. That um, you know where we're very focused on giving independent writers, um, you know, not only great tools to plug into our services, but portability. So that way, you know, people feel like, okay, I can take my email list um, and I can take it to another service if I want. Um, I can take my, my, my list of people who subscribe to me over here and I can build um, a community and another service if I want, right? To, to use a different, a different groups um, app if, if, I, if I don't want to use Facebook groups for that. So I think that, that kind of portability is helping to build up this whole ecosystem um, in a way that I think will be very valuable 
because all of these different tools and business models are ultimately going to be necessary to reach this goal of supporting millions of people making a living doing this kind of creative work um, over the next five to 10 years. But, but it is an area that I'm very excited about. Um, and we're, we're very dedicated to doing this across not just one type of content, but, but all the different types of content. And, and I, I think increasing